But if there is a favorite to finish in the top two, it would be 27-year-old Josh Davis, triple gold medalist from the 96 Olympics. Most golds, Rowdy, by any American man at those games. You know, I have seen Josh Davis take a lot of races out very fast, but I've never seen Josh take it out that fast. And he's still ahead of world record pace of the half. Mark Davis looks like he's going to win it. And Davis sets an American record. He breaks a 12-year-old mark. What a swim for Davis. Welcome to the Ultimate Swimmer Podcast. I'm your host, three-time Olympic gold medalist and captain of the 2000 USA team, Josh Davis. Here at Ultimate Swimmer, we hope to inform, inspire, and encourage you to be the very best version of you, physically, mentally, and spiritually, on your swimming journey. This podcast is geared primarily for those of us in the aquatic disciplines of age group swimming, college swimming, para swimming, open water swimming, and master swimming. But we welcome all who are interested in peak performance, pursuing excellence, and swimming with purpose. So whether you are just starting out in the pool or you've been swimming your entire life, you were born for the water and you were also born for greatness. So each week we will explore the seven core habits of achieving greatness that will help take you to the next level in your journey to becoming an ultimate swimmer. This episode is brought to you by Breakout Swim Clinics, the longest running swim clinic tour of swimming Olympians in U.S. history. Breakout Swim Clinics has been providing swim clubs with the biggest Olympic names for the best prices with gold medal service since 1997. Go to BreakoutSwimClinic.com and bring some of their great Olympians to your team to help your swimmers break out. Bigger names, better prices, gold medal service. Break out with the best. BreakoutSwimClinic.com. Hey, welcome everybody to another Ultimate Swimmer podcast show. I'm really excited about this week's guest. He is uh, 12 NC2A college titles, unbelievable. And he's coached over 49 Olympians from 19 different countries. Uh, and he's put all those Olympians on the last six Olympic games. He's uh, truly an ultimate swim coach. He's an ultimate mentor, ultimate dad, ultimate husband, ultimate motivator and team builder, and even was an ultimate swimmer himself. Please welcome to the show. Uh, head Olympic coach from 2016, Dave Marsh. Welcome to the show, Dave. Thank you, Josh, and, and congrats on uh, the podcast and the great job you're doing with your college team and just the amazing impact you're having on our sport. You know, you're there is uh, Josh, you're, you are the number one person when I've asked the most people, and the latest was Camille Adams. I said, what was the ignition moment in your swimming career? You're the number one answer I've gotten over a long period of time as being the name of the person that is the number one ignition person. When you put that, when you share your medal like you've had for years and years and years, and a kid puts it in their hand and they look at you and listen to your story, it's uh, it's it's a, it's a life changer for a lot of them. I know for Camille, it was it was it was what she put her finger on last the last time I talked with her. And uh, thank you for doing that. And I hope that this podcast and whether it be with coaches or swimmers can help uh, with, with anyone possible because you and I are about the same thing. We're just about, you know, lifting up people, lifting up God and lifting up the, our great sport. And, uh, and and we need people that love this, you know. Amen. Hey, that means a lot. Thanks for saying that. And uh, so you you and I go go kind of far back. I think I first met you in 94 when UT Texas came to Auburn before the new pool right and we, we raced in the old pool wow yeah and uh i bet y'all were glad for the new pool holy cow honestly i i tell you that the old pool at auburn had so many great memories I, I can't tell you that it's all happiness when we got to the, the big new fancy pool you know there's there so much tradition back there we had some swim mates where there are people hanging off the rafters I mean, John T. Skinner and, and a group of uh, swimmers, we were just uh, recalling the Auburn-Alabama dual meets back when they had their six-lane, 25-yard pool. We had our pool and and just some of the unique approaches we had, you know, one of which was we try to get always give them the worst seating possible. So you put them near the windows that are big, have the biggest cracks so it's cold. And, you know, January, you're doing the dual meet against Bama. You want them to be freezing. So you put them yeah. near the, the doors that, that have the biggest draft. You put the, the football team on one side, uh, the, the cheerleaders on the other side to try to distract them in two different ways. And, uh, and you say, good luck swimming. But uh, we, had, we had some great times back then, some, you know, some relay races, that, some meets that came down to last relays. And uh, 
uh, yeah, no doubt that that uh, you know the 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 atmosphere in those old pools we, we do miss. And you know, Eddie, your your uh, your college coach, he had a lot of incredible meets there. He's really the guy that took Auburn swimming to the next level during his window there. So right. there was a lot of lot of impact by Eddie Reese back in the day uh, at Auburn. And, and without him, you know, Auburn doesn't make the climb it made. Yeah. Well, Eddie, Rowdy, and, and you and many others um, really put Auburn on the map for sure. And did you and Rowdy overlap a little bit? Yeah, Rowdy and I were very, very uh, close teammates, and uh, he, he was one year behind me, but I came in as a junior college transfer, so I came in after him. He uh, So Dave McCagg had just won the world championship in the 100 freestyle. Billy Forrester won the 200 freestyle at that world championship. And Rowdy was on relays that won golds in the 400 free relay and the in the 800 freestyle relay. So I was coming on this team with a brand new coach named Richard Quick, who replaced Eddie Reese. And that's really where I got my chance to come to Auburn because when Eddie left, so many of those guys left to go to Texas with them. It cleared out some scholarship money and gave me a chance to sort of sneak in there uh, as the fifth ranked backstroker when I arrived to uh, to, to to Auburn and actually. Uh, Brad Schwindix, who's, who's out there in Midland, Texas, is was one of my uh, teammates. It was another great backstroker. And but Rowdy and I, by the end of the year, ended up swimming on the same relays together, the medley relays. And we have a great story. When you get Rowdy on the podcast, if you haven't had him yet, you need to ask him about the 400 uh, medley relay his junior year, my senior year, when uh, we finished uh, the backstroke leg. Uh, Auburn was in first place. And when we finished the freestyle leg that he, you know, that, that he uh, brought home, which, you know, he at the time, he's the best swimmer in the world. Uh, we only got fourth place. So I, I really blame it on Rowdy that he couldn't do his job. I did my job. He didn't do his job. Or otherwise, I'd have had a national title individual as, as a relay member. But, you know, sometimes you, you, you can't you can't uh, can't count on the, or stars like, you know, Rowdy. So <laughs> just let him know that when you, when you bring that story yeah. up. Yeah, I'll definitely ask him and rid him about that. <laughs> Blowing the lead, man. Um. Well, obviously, uh, Richard Quick had a huge impact on your trajectory, and um, so I'm, I'm grateful I got to cross paths with him many times, as are you. So any, any thoughts you want to throw out there about Richard and his impact on you? Well, I can't. I mean, I, I couldn't say enough about Richard. Richard's, R- Richard has, uh, in many ways, when I, when I, you know, when I started swimming, as I was a late bloomer in swimming, I didn't start swimming until I was 10th grade when I got cut from the baseball team. And then I uh, went to swimming because my brother did it. And when I went to go to my first swim practice, I couldn't find my bicycle because I needed to ride my bicycle about three miles to go to practice instead of walking. And uh, he had hidden my bicycle. So I couldn't take the bicycle to swim practice because he didn't want me to swim. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and anyway, so I did swim anyway. And finally, I got to swim my first swim meet, Josh. My first swim meet, I swam the 100-yard freestyle. I uh, had shorts on that, you know, came down to my knees and uh, had hair, no goggles. I'd flick my hair when I uh, when I was breathing. Uh, went 123 in the 100-yard freestyle on my first swim meet in 10th grade. Wow. So I was pretty darn fast, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> no flip turns. <laughs> yeah. So that's where I started. And so that's 10th grade. And by my senior year, I was 58, 6 and 100 backstroke. I went to Indian River Community College to follow Reed Lewis and Tom Epling and a lot of my my uh, guys from high school years that that had gone there, and then and then uh, got real lucky because when Eddie, Eddie left Texas, uh, Richard was looking for a backstroker. By then, I had swum uh, my by my sophomore year, I'd gone fifty three in the hundred back, which back then was a pretty good time. Yeah, and uh, and Richard gave me a shot. You know, and and I was, you know, I was six foot three, about 155 pounds. I I generally have to run around the shower to get wet. Uh, But (laughs) but I can't, you know, the Richard Quick story, I could not say enough. He's he's was my uh, the the first coach I'd had for more than a year because my 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, first year of college, second year of college until my junior year of college. I had had a different coach every single year. Wow. So it wasn't like I had one. I wasn't a club swimmer, so I didn't know really what, really what club swimming was. Yeah. My junior year, I hooked up with a guy named Tim Shedd, who uh, was a became a club coach, and he was a great great coach. But but he was uh, uh, someone that sort of walked me through this sport a little bit more. 
But when I ran into Richard, I found my uh, uh, personal mentor, my coaching mentor. Uh, the, and, and I didn't know it at the time I was going to be a coach, but uh, certainly the coach I have uh, tried to model myself after as a, as a coach and, and in many ways as a human being, uh, uh, you know, up to this time in my life. So if, if, there's, if there's one guy that had an impact in my life more than any other, uh, it, would, it, would, it would be measured by Richard Quick. Yeah, that's fascinating. I love that. Um, <clears throat> so tell us about, you know, before, before the great um, re- legacy at Auburn and, and before Swim Mac and before San Diego, um, tell us about some of your other key stops into the coaching career. I know there was a stop in Vegas. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I was really fortunate because because I got to sort of you know hook on to Richard's uh, uh, belt buck, you know, you know belt loop and just follow him around to conventions and to coaches meetings and things like that. I got to meet the best in the sport very quickly. So I uh, got to sit in, in in meetings and 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 uh, you know opportunities to sitting around at a bar or sitting around in conversations, one off conversations listening to the greatest minds there are in a sport, whether it be Doc Councilman, whether it be, uh, uh, you know, Eddie or whether it be, you know, the, I mean, just the best of the best would, I would get, you know, access to. Yeah. So I was really fast forwarded in many ways. So I was very, very fortunate, but I was there, you know, with Richard, eventually he left to go to Texas and I, and I stayed with John Asmuth and then, uh, and then, there was an opportunity to go to Dynamo Swim Club in Atlanta, and I actually worked for Pat Hogan, who at the time was doing a great job in, in Atlanta. And I went in and as a senior coach, so I only had to work with, you know, about thirty senior kids in the program, and that was my my only job was focusing on them. Uh, and I've said many times to this to this point in my career, that was really the best job I ever had, the best pure swim coach job I ever had. I was twenty four years old. I had 30 junior national junior national level swimmers uh they were eager they were fiery i mean there were people like uh, uh eric wonderlick uh marilyn blanchard i mean these these guys later on they went on to set american records they made olympic teams they did all kinds of amazing things and uh i got to sort of experiment with them I, they you know I, I wasn't given really any parameters i said coach them and so i coached the tar out of them you know I, you know it's back when lactate testing was a thing so we got a lactate machine and we were lactate testing everybody and doing all that you know so we, we're at the you know we're practice we're like hitting their fingers and hitting their ears to get blood out of them and you know we, there was no gloves there was no there was no consideration yeah. of you know hygiene it was just like get get the blood quickly here you know, get the blood out of me and uh so we were you know we, it was just it was a it was an interesting time in in our sport in general because it was really transitioning from the high volume time and I, you know, I wasn't, uh, you know, coming through the sport. I had high volume. I, mean, I had, uh, for one of my junior college years, I had Jim Montrella, who was a relatively high volume guy. I mean, Richard, uh, Jim's one of my other mentors, and I love him to death. He and Bev are two of my great friends. But I did some things there that were like, uh, you know, 20,000 a day type things occasionally. And so I went through that phase. But by the time I got to uh, Dynamo, I was able to design my training around really more my the philosophy I had begun to put together, mm-hmm. and uh, it really it really advanced me very quickly because I was sort of protected as a senior coach. Now that only mm-hmm. lasted one year. By the second year, uh, Pat took the job at Mecklenburg Swim Club in Charlotte, and I was left as the head coach. And I'm, I'm 25 years old. I have I have 19 board of directors that I'm trying to work with in Atlanta. I know nothing about a board of directors. Uh, yeah. and, and so it was, it was, uh, it, it, I, I, I learned very quickly. I had a lot of great coaches that worked on that staff for me. So it was, uh, it was, it was a wonderful opportunity. Uh, but then I did move on to the Las Vegas gold and, and Las Vegas gold is where I cut, co- I coached, uh, uh, Tyler Mayfield and Alex Fedorov and Maurice Stewart. And, and eventually, uh, uh, Melvin Stewart came out to swim with me and several of the, the professional swimmers I began to get a sort of a precursor to what I'd eventually be doing now, which uh, I didn't back then. There was there certainly was nothing. There was no pro groups. There was so, certainly no money in the sport, but a, a visionary and a, a gentleman named Dick Carson, who funded the team and really underwrote the expenses. He, uh, you know, Dick's the one that had the idea that, that swimming deserved more than this. Now, Dick had uh, three 
three kids who were in the swimming club program. So what a great investment you can make by having a great swim program where you hire Rowdy Gaines to start it. You bring me in afterwards. I hired Bob Bowman. I hired uh, uh, some some of some outstanding coaches back then that that built a, a very special team in, in Las Vegas for a you know a significant period of time that made a real impact on the sport. He had put up money for anybody that would could break a world record. He would give a hundred thousand dollars, and he he'd go to like uh, he went, I remember going to Seattle Nationals. You may I was remember, there. remember this. Yeah, and he I was there. The lays, out, lays out the hundred thousand dollars in the lobby, right? It was a, a huge security cube, guard. a huge cube of cash with a security guard. We had never seen anything yeah. like it, and yeah. we thought, "Oh boy, I hope Mel gets it." And Mel, of course, tried tried it for the two hundred fly. He was close, but yeah, he was close. He almost got it, but uh, it, it was a, it was a you know it was, it, it, so Las Vegas was a, a great again a great growing opportunity. Uh, when I was in Las Vegas, for all you, all the young coaches that are you know watching your show. Uh, I applied for every college coaching job that came open because I thought that's what I wanted to do. I, I applied for, you know, for SMU, for Arizona. I applied for Indian River Community College. It came open, Miami. I, and I applied for all kinds of jobs. Got all, all, all rejections because I was 30, 30 years old, too young, too young. And then Auburn came open and, uh, and, and then they gave me a shot. Uh, and again, for the young coaches out there and even really for the swimmers out there, I mean, at the end of the day, the reason – Pat Dye, who was a football coach, hired me was because uh, he 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 and Buddy Davidson, who was the assistant AD, they remembered that back when I was at Auburn as a as a young sort of volunteer coach and helping with the start, I coached the club team, but I also worked with uh, the college team as well and did a lot of the recruiting. Uh, I would recruit until eleven or twelve at night because you know I was coaching called make I was the one making the West Coast calls. And back then you, you recruited on a Watts line. So it was just this, you, the only way you can make a recruiting call because swimming teams didn't get credit cards. We had to use, we had to use the Watts line. The Watts line was a free phone call. In all of Auburn Athletic Department, there's only two lines that were Watts lines. And so you had to have a super fast finger that as soon as that light lit up, you had to press it really fast so you could make your call to the recruit. And I was really good at it. So, uh, uh, so I did a lot of the recruiting, but anyway, a lot of those nights at 11 o'clock, 12 at night, I would just go out and sleep in the, the, uh, the couch of the athletic department and then go down to morning practice. And that really got me the job to this day. That's what, uh, buddy Davidson said was the, the, the difference maker was when he explained to, to, to the, to the boss of the, the AD, uh, Pat Dye at the time that, that he remember has those memories. He knew I would work really hard for Auburn. And, uh, and sure enough, when I was given a chance, when I was out in Las Vegas to take the Auburn job, I did, and and I and I did it. I did it with a passion, uh, and 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 a, a probably I probably I was you know quite ferocious when I first took the job, about you know my my uh, my passion. So my club background sort of led me that way. I didn't know to this point that that having gone through all those years as a club coach at different, you know, different situations and the lessons I'd learned would prepare me so well for college coaching, but it was really critical that I had those years as a club coach. I think that without that, I wouldn't have been able to go into Auburn and, and, uh, and do what I did as quickly as we were able to do it. Yeah. I mean, you, you get there and by the late nineties, you guys are a powerhouse and then you proceed to win 97, 99, zero, Zero one zero two. I mean, there was twelve all together, and then oh three, oh four, oh six. You win both men and women, and so I know there was a little back and forth between Auburn and Texas, winning some titles. But but pretty much it was you guys going into the the new century and uh, at the you know in the two, early two thousands, and it was it was incredible. The 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 assistant coaches that you mentored up and equipped and delegated to and athletes you brought up i mean kind of honestly some no names and we didn't know who these people were and then come in c2a's they would just make top eight and we're like who are these people <laughs> and you would and, and your team always had a nice confident swagger about them and I'm, i i wonder if you can address that how did you you know instill confidence and swagger into your team and and i know your your dry land program was legendary. Um, 
you know, is it PK? Is that how you say his name? That's yeah, uh, Brian Karkowski. He, 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 his name is uh, PK because he's a place kicker on the football team. <laughs> That's but right. He, en he ended up being only the kickoff kicker, but he's legendary because there's there's one game where he got two personal fouls for for hitting the the return running the runner uh, out out outside when they when they ran out of bounds. He would hit him anyway, and he did it twice <laughs> in one game. <laughs> and so he, he was legendary for his, uh, and, and he was a very aggressive guy. Uh, you know, to address that, I would, I would say the, uh, the swagger and the, the reputation, uh, uh, was honestly artificial at first. You know, when I first took the job at Auburn, uh, there wasn't swagger. You know, I, I went to the SECs the year before I took the job because I was watching a variety of summers that I was coaching out in Las Vegas. And, you know, I went into the pool at University of Alabama, Stephanie Putsey, Stephanie Barnes, now one of the great coaches out there in Texas. She's a, doing a great job with a lot of little kids in San Antonio right now. Uh, she's she did win the SECs in the 200 breaststrokes. So that was the highlight. But outside of that, it was a it was really painful to watch the Auburn swimmers and their uh their posture when they walked into the pool, their, they didn't walk in together. There was no camaraderie. There was no confidence. And I, and I just harken back to my days in the eighties, we didn't win any championships when I was there with Rowdy and McCag and Forrester and, and, and Brian Haas and, and Rick Morley and those guys. But we always had the attitude that we were, that we were there to, to try to go win. Yeah. And so when I came back to Auburn, that was the first thing I instilled. In fact, the very first swim practice, uh, Josh, what we did is we didn't actually get in the water. We actually practiced giving handshakes and looking each other, well, looking me in the eye when they shook my hand uh, to practice that skill of communicating to another person because they were really bad at it. When I was yeah. meeting them, when I first arrived, it was like, you know, give me dead fish handshakes and looking off somewhere. And I'm like, no, that's not a champion's, you know, behavior yeah. and then and then and then also then the first practice also we we uh uh i had them all take ta their towels and put towels around their neck and tie their towels and walk around the pool you know and i told them when they finished this they didn't know what i was doing i told them walk around the pool and said do you know how much better your posture is as you're walking around the pool that towel around your neck and you feel mm -hmm. like superman you got a cape. That's the yeah. way I want you to live. Yeah, you got a cape on. So you're popped up, you're <laughs> you're proud. And that's what we need yeah. to have at all. We need to be proud. So uh, honestly, a lot of the uh the early on stuff you saw at Auburn was a bit of a sham. It was, it was sort of fake. We just sort of acted as if. Yeah. And then we became, you know, and, and and that was part of our theme. There's a back then there was a study about the Pygmalion effect, which was basically the the uh, the, 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 the pretty woman or the my fair lady uh, sort of story of, of you dress up people as if and, and you know, and, and, and then they become that. Right. Uh, well, now, now, back then, we I had no budget at Auburn. I had the, you know, a tiny budget. So so what Jeff Dugdale and my other coaches, we'd run around and try to find deals with Russell Mills and other companies that would give us gear so that we could look like a good team. Cool, and yeah. so we, we got donations and, and we really dressed ourselves up. I mean, I, it, when I first got to Auburn, my first dealer car, cause you know, when you're a head college coach, you get a dealer car, which is basically a free car. It's amazing. Yeah. But my first dealer car, Josh was a, was a, was a geo Metro with the, the passenger door had a big dent in it. That was what oh, I got geez. from my dealer. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> So on big recruiting weekends, I would rent a car. I'd go to Atlanta, pick up a recruit, and I'd also rent a car. And then right. I'd drive and recruit around in, my, in a convertible all weekend. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was a bit of a show at the beginning. And then what happened was we started, you know, having good results. We had got, we got a good reputation of, you know, I had already had a good reputation as a co club coach before that of having people swim fast when they, they swam with me. And we had some Auburn people that they didn't hurt, had nobody had ever heard of, you know, begin to pop. And, uh, you know, when you get Bill Pilziks and Dean Hutchinson's and Robin Williford's and, and Aaron Gales and people like that, they go from nowhere mm -hmm. being some of the fastest swimmers in the country. You know, yeah. it, it, it does get people's attention. And that's sort of what began to happen. And, and I was real fortunate when I first took the job, I hired uh, Dave Bottom as my assistant coach and, he, and we brought in Mike Bottom as a GA. Right. And uh, that sort of escalated things right away. And, and uh, yeah, my 
the, the, the story of the Auburn history is the story of a lot of assistant coaches that came through, gave their passion for three or four or five years and, uh, and made their mark and then in, and often moved on to better jobs or great, you know, high impact things, you know, like Dave Durden now. But, uh, but it was, you know, the, 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 the formula wasn't so much a uh, t- uh, signing all the stars. We would often sign the second tier swimmers. Right. You know, the Pat Calhouns and the Tyler McGill's and the, you know, the, the, the athletes that weren't necessarily, you know, the, the number one names. And then we'd bring them in and get them a lot better. Right. And, and part of the weight room routine you were referring to was really a bit of a gauntlet they would go to go through in the fall. And it was pretty legendary. I mean, there's be times they'd be in the weight room for two, three hours. And uh, I eventually got to where I, I didn't even like going down there and watching it because it's so painful for me to watch. I just sort of held my nose and dealt with it. And this is back when you could do a little bit more stuff like this. Uh, nowadays, you could never push kids like uh, PK used to push them. Uh, but there, there, there's, there's a lot of interesting Auburn stories from back in the day. He'd always have the, the last day of the circuit be called Big Dog Day. And you, everybody knew and everybody feared this day. And uh, and they, they would go in the weight room and there'd be always some theme. And whether it be Halloween costumes or he painted all the the uh, the, the windows uh, shut or he made a really nasty smelling room to where people, you know, would be more likely to throw up, uh, you know, creating creating uh, an atmosphere that would be emotionally challenging. Uh, but we would find out, you know, sort of what our team was made of pretty quickly. And uh, eventually when we start sign- started signing some stars, I actually had to protect a lot of them. You know, when Cesar Cielo come- came in, I-, I-, I put, you know, we'd put an orange jersey on somebody that's injured. I mean, Cesar had no injury, but I put an orange jersey right on him. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> don't mess with this guy. He's injured. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't want him. I don't want him going anywhere. You know, yeah, and, and so some of these guys. Me. Yeah. So we would, we would protect some of the guys eventually. And, and, uh, but the the stories were were uh, we were learning as we went went along. There really wasn't a template for the way we were doing it. My and one of my inspirations was Don Gambrell at University of Alabama, and, and I always mm-hmm. felt like if Don was runner up at the NCAAs, he won SECs a couple times. If he could do it there at Alabama, we could do it at Auburn because I felt like we were, you know, we had sort of an engineering school, so we could get good recruits that uh, they would be interested in high tech engineering things, and and uh, so we just sort of made it work and, and kept, uh, kept it going. And, you know, 2007 was my last year coaching there. And Dorsey Tierney Walker was my associate head women's coach. Uh, she's just done an amazing job at Ohio state this last year. I think she was the difference maker for bill this past year. Uh, one of the best coaches I've ever stood on a deck with. And, uh, we went out and we won the men's, the men's championship and the women's championship that year, uh, before I went off to, uh, to, to, to Mecklenburg and, and started coaching over in Charlotte. That's amazing. I wanted to take a moment from this fascinating interview to let you know about a new partner for the Ultimate Swimmer podcast, and that is Swimshare. Swimshare is a free workout riding tool. Just Google Swimshare, all one word, Swimshare. And you can put in today's workout in just a few clicks, and it sends and stores all your workouts within seconds. The first workout you'll see on there is one of my favorites from yours truly. Check out Swimshare. And take your workouts to the next level. Send, store, and share your swimming masterpieces with Swimshare. I'm just going to read through the quick list of some of the names that were on your staff at Auburn uh, or, or that you've coached with um, in addition, in, even at Vegas. You mentioned Bob Bowman already, Mike Bottom, Kim Bracken, Dave Durden, Brett Hawk, Jeff Dugdale. I mean, this is really kind of a who's who of people that learned under you and went, like you said, went off to do some amazing things. So, you know, I, I think that's a huge compliment to you and to your ability to delegate and to let them, you know, kind of cut their teeth and have authority and and learn the ropes, too. So whatever you did, you did you did amazing. And, uh, well, and the amazing thing was a lot of those people were like, like, like Mike Bottom, who came as a GA, like Dave Durden, who came as a complete volunteer assistant coach. I mean, a lot of them came with their hat in their head and said, I just want to learn. Can I just come be a part of the atmosphere? And that's a really important lesson for not only the swimmers here that, you know, when you when you when you want to seek out opportunity, go ask for it. And, uh, and, and coaches, when you 
want to put yourself in a position to uh, uh, to learn from the best, go get around the best. Just go. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Figure out a way to, if you have to sit in the stands, go sit in the stands. Maybe, maybe you can come to the pool deck sometime, or maybe you can go stand next to the coach sometime. But I think those are things that you want to do is just get around the people that, uh, that, that you feel like you want to learn from. And, and, and there's no better way of learning than to be nearby. Great advice. So you're at Swim Mac for the 08, 012, and 016 Olympics. And you put a good amount of people on each team. And um, some wonderful names there that you got to work with. Cullen Jones, uh, Ryan Lochte, Camille, uh, and, and many others. Does any particular um, athletes or stories or moments stick out to you um, in your time at Swim Mac? And, and maybe it's with some of the club kids um, and, and not just the team elite pro kids. But does anything stick out in the athletes you got to work with? Because I know there's one that sticks out in my mind that I'll, that I'll ask you about, but I want to get yours first. Well, the goal was to build a program, a club program, where – you had a pro group that was role models for the kids. So the kids could see what true excellence looked like. Because in Charlotte, there's there's no good college, big college swim teams. There's, that was you say there's no good, but there's no big college swim teams that are competing like there is in Raleigh. There's three college teams in Raleigh. So these kids didn't get to see high level swimming on a, on a, on a very, very regular basis. So in Charlotte, uh, when I, when I, in fact, when they came, they asked me to look at the job. And in fact, uh, the, the, you know, Jeff Gacka was the main guy, of course, but also a guy named Frank Reich, who's now the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts. He was he came with, with Jeff to to recruit me to come take this job. And and uh, I told him, like, look, guys, you know, when I when I when I look at Charlotte from Auburn's perspective, I'm recruiting. You know, what I do is I drive through ID five and when I hit the Charlotte city limits, I hit the accelerator and drive through Charlotte as fast as I can to get to Raleigh because that's where the good swimmers are that are going to make a difference for my program down the road. Charlotte wasn't developing that level swimmer back then. And I said, that's really disappointing because of the population and uh, the potential was there, of course, all along. Uh, so we were able to build up the program. I was very proud of, of uh, you know, guys like uh, coaches like Russ Castle and John Fadina and Dave Cook and and Sarah Holman and, and uh, you know, Kathy McKee at her time and, and people that sort of, uh, and in fact, in a case like uh, John and, and uh, Russ, they were willing to go from being senior coaches. I said, guys, I need you coaching age groupers because age groupers makes the difference. If you don't get it right between the age of 11 and 14 years old, you don't get those strokes down, then you can forget it. You're never going to be what you could be. So I had senior level, high level coaches willing to, go and take care of those younger kids in that window. And that's part of why we became the, you know, club excellence winners. And we won uh, several times with a, you know, with a 700 member club, we were competing against some Atlanta with 2000 swimmers and against uh, nation's capital of 2000 swimmers, but we were able to compete uh, because, you know, the, the, these coaches had done such a great job with young kids. There was one window of time where we broke every 17, 18 uh, relay record. There's another window where our win broke almost all the 11 and 12 and 13, 14 records. And yes, those, those swimmers, <clears throat> as they have come along, have been uh, a lot of fun to watch through their careers and, and getting to work with their development at a young age and getting them, you know, trying to help them get it really right was, uh, was part of the big goal. Uh, I, I, you know, I think there's, there was a moment. So I created a group called the Turbo Group. At a North and a South program, so it's North Charlotte, South Charlotte, but there was a historically black college in the middle of town called Johnson C. Smith, and we had a, I, I put a, a, a group there called the Turbo Group, so I took the best the 13 and 14 year olds from North and South, they would come twice a week and train together, and they'd mix it up at this pool, and then we'd have Team Elite, and then a few of the uh, senior kids come and do the same thing. And uh, in fact, Davis Tarwater on Tuesdays would have a get tough club where he invited uh, all the boys that wanted to get tougher to come train with him. And he would put on his own practice and uh, they would have uh, boy talk at first and then they'd race for, you know, an hour and a half and he would show them how to show them how to get tough. So this kind of stuff was going on. So it's no wonder that that Swimac was doing so well at that point. And then the the uh, and then I'd say the other sort of really cool thing was that. 
uh, the vision of these kids. They understood what true excellence looked like. They didn't. They didn't have a, a, a artificial idea idea that because they were uh, North Carolina State champion that they had it made. They knew they had to keep on going, keep on fighting. And I think that was a real key to building a program. And I and I, and I at that point. There's a book called The Talent Code that a lot of your coaches uh, will know about, but that that book had come out, and uh, I really took that to heart and really built our program around some of the the theme of the Talent Code, and it fits so well because we had a lot of the makeup of what uh, the Talent Code uh, suggested that you try to do to to build a program of true excellence, and we were able to do that for a a long period of time in uh, in Charlotte, and we we. Uh, had good times. And, and you know, I, I just went, came back from ISL and several of the swimmers in the ISL meet are, are former little swim mat kids that were on the program back then, back in those days. So including my daughter, Alyssa, who, who is, uh, was- who, swam, who swam for the best team. And, uh, and it was, it was, it's been, but it's been a lot of fun to, to watch, uh, the, the, the kids develop. And, uh, you know, uh, you're probably talking about Kathleen Baker, but she's one that was one of those young kids in the program that, that was sitting on the sidelines at first and then was able to train with Team Elite. When she did, she took advantage of it and uh, was able to advance uh, uh, substantially through her her career. Yeah, that's amazing. The story I was thinking of was uh, Cullen Jones, how you were able to kind of catch him at just the right time in 08 to get him on track and then kind of had to do the same thing again in 2012. Yeah. You know, kind of have a, <laughs> a little heart to heart saying, all right, if we're going to do this, we got to do it right. But um, but but you do have a knack for kind of getting in these thoroughbreds' heads and helping them mentally prepare. And there's a lot of people, a lot of swim people across the world right now. They're dealing with this Corona break. They need to kind of get their confidence back and their focus back. And um, you know, do you recall something you you you've said that really made a difference to some of these athletes in the past? I think, you know, Josh, I don't think there's any one thing. I think you have to talk to every athlete and the way they need to, to, to hear things. And for Cullen, I always knew that he was a guy that, that, you know, he was to me like a little bit like a boxer where he was always at his best when the, the, he, he sort of got in the mode of, okay, it's close enough. It's 12 weeks out. I need to go in training, training camp mode. So I'm shutting down all the extra peripheral stuff. I'm going to shut out some of the appearances, things like that. And I'm going to go, go into the hard training. And that would be sort of his the, the method he would, uh, would would go about. Now this, you know, Cullen never comes to Charlotte. Had uh, had the national team director at the time, Mark Schubert, not encouraged him to come and gone out of his way, like to some degree, probably even uncomfortably, suggesting he come. And I think that was a a, a real fortunate thing for for him and for me, because uh, I was able to coach him sort of personally. There was a window of time there where I only had two national team swimmers. And I would say, hey, uh, today it looks like my schedule is going to allow me to coach you about 10 o'clock. Can you come in at 10 o'clock? And, of course, for Cullen, that's a great time to train. You know, a professional <laughs> swimmer, one of the nice things is you don't have to go in at, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning to swim. You can come in, you know, at, at, a, at a, and for, you know, for sprinters, that's a, that's a treat. I was, I, was, I was coaching Kristen Golomov a little while ago, just a, a few hours ago over in uh, San Diego, and and we have a 6 a.m. morning practice, but he doesn't get invited to that practice. He has to come a little bit later when the water's warmer and the sun's out. You know, so that those 50 freestylers take a certain temperature in order to be able to perform well. But uh, no, Cullen is uh, was a really really unique guy in that uh, he was someone who would would go from hating training, always loved racing, but hated training to putting up with training. As soon as he would go to that mode of, okay, I'm going to put up with it for a while. It was yeah. like, okay, I got your attention. And then we do everything we had to do in yeah. a short period of time. But he, fortunately he was talented enough to where as long as he would do that, he would, he would be in great shape. You know, Anthony Irvin in this last Olympics was a little bit like that in that he came in from Dave Salo where he, he, you know, hadn't been uh, completely pleased and, and says, I, you know, I want something different. I want to try something different, but, you know, he he did have a stroke looking good. He was in good shape. Yeah. And all I had to do was really give him the sort of the special sauce and the special belief. And I do think uh, I think that's one of the biggest points I'd make to you and to the swimmers is belief. You know, Richard Quick's saying was believe in belief. 
And I do believe that is the critical piece of this whole thing. If Cullen didn't believe, if Anthony Irvin didn't believe, if you didn't believe, Josh, uh, then it's not going to happen. And, and, and belief isn't just a casual, yeah, I believe that piece of paper is white. No, it, belief is a deep inner feeling of, of uh, sort of or, organic from your toes, you know, you're from your, your toes to your fingertips. It's you live and you resonate it when you believe and you can see when somebody believes. And there's just a look in their eye when they believe, and and I think that's something that that uh, that that that's something as a coach or as a swimmer you got to get there. Uh, and 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 doggone it, if if there hasn't been enough great stories in our sport of people who were uh, not known as amazing swimmers, and the next thing you know, they're some of the best in the world. Uh, we have an amazing sport that way. I mean, nobody keep that in mind. God didn't make anybody a swimmer. God made us to walk on land and to run around and go chase things and uh, look silly. Well, he didn't make any of us swim in the water. So when we jump in the water without any swim lessons or without any swimming background, we drowned. So we have to get some lessons and then we have to learn how to swim. And then we learn how to float in the water, which we're not very good at. And then we learn how to move through the water, which also we're not very good at. I always say, look, I had probably the most fish-like guy in the history of the sport with Ryan Lochte. And uh, the, the, the worst little Nemo Garibaldi off of La Jolla Shores uh, would be 100 times more efficient and faster than Ryan Lochte just with a couple w- wiggles of the tail. Right. And, the, and we're not efficient in the water. Humans aren't efficient. The great thing about that is there's a lot of potential for people if they'll pay attention to what they're doing, if they'll learn to build a relationship with the water that can make – progress in our sport unlike a lot of sports where you have to be super fast you have to be able to jump you know 45 inches in vertical jump you have to be just a freak to excel in our sport it's not like that we we can excel in our sport a whole lot of different ways by building that feeling in the water i mean today when i was working with jacob pebbly uh in his training session you know we we spent time on trying to hold just a quarter inch more water for every backstroke pull. That was the goal yeah. today, just to hold a quarter inch more water for every time you put your hand in the water and your your body's going by your hand. Uh, if you could do that, we would have a, we, we, we'd have a potential to be faster. And that was the goal today. Yeah, I love that. We have a great sport that way, yeah. I wanna take a quick break from this super fun interview to tell you about an awesome new resistance tool I found at gmx7training.com. Swimming with the GMX-7 training resistance system allows me and my swimmers to not just go 25s, but 50s and beyond. GMX-7 training allows you to get strength gains faster, engage the core more, feel the catch of the water better, and get more work done in less time. GMX-7training.com. Don't just get strong, get swimming strong. Check it out at GMX-7training.com. Well, just a few last couple of questions. Um, you, you've had great impact on the club level, collegiate level, and now getting to work with some of the top pros in the world. Um, what would you say is is your favorite of the three? And you know, what are some positive and negatives that come to mind, or what, what would you say is your sweet spot of the club, college, or pro? Wow, that's that great question. I hadn't been asked that question before. Thank you. Uh, Am I allowed to say all three? <laughs> I, <laughs> sure. I, I have sure. found that I like the whole process. I love the whole process yeah. about our sport. I even love uh, learn to swim. I love the, the fact that kids come to our sport in such a variety of ways. Uh, you know, I was watching Gary Hall's son teach swim lessons over in Coronado Island the other day. And I went over and I said, I, said it's, I love the way your teachers are teaching kids to love the water. Uh, I don't like it when swim instructors, you know, dunk kids underwater and they're screaming and crying. And it's, it's, it's a force thing. I, I love it when they learn how to love the water. They love the experience. I also love it when a, when a, when a, when an age group coach of an eight year old gets a kid to look up and go, Oh my gosh, I, I just accomplished something I've never done before. I swam a whole lap of butterfly. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, my Maddie, when she was, uh, when she was, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years old, she swam in her first, uh, 25 backstroke and uh, she in, in this 25 backstroke in, in an outdoor pool at Auburn and Auburn, Alabama, 
she took a, a minute and 21 seconds to swim across a <laughs> uh, 25 yard pool. It was one point where she was moving her arms backwards and wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. But while she's doing that, she has a big smile on her face. It was like, it was amazing. Yeah. It was like, this yeah. is so awesome. And then, and then getting to walk through as a swim dad with Alyssa through her career, being mm -hmm. able to, to walk through that whole experience. My wife, Kristen, is, uh, is an excellent coach as well. So we've, we've done swimming, the swimming life together. And, uh, you know, she swam at Cal Berkeley. And, and uh, so we're the, the things we've been able to enjoy together in the sport have been such a blessing and such a, uh, an incredible uh, experience for our family. And, and we're just grateful for that. And, and uh, the fact that I've been able to make a career out of it and been able to, you know, live pretty well and been privileged in, in so many ways to, to have that, that kind of lifestyle and, and that kind of impact on people has been a wonderful thing. So I, I have nothing to complain about and, and just you know, really all, all gratitude at this point. You know, I'm in that phase of life. You know, I'm coming up on my 62nd birthday and, and I'm in that sort of second half of life and the, 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 the chapter where sort of defining what, uh, you know, what kind of legacy that I can leave and, and uh, if, if it can be that, that the sport is better for me and some people that I've interacted with are better for interactions that we've had, that's, that's even better. I mean, I'm looking over to my left side right here, that painting right there. That's Rick DeMont's painting. Yep. It's in my living room. So I want uh, a Rick painting someday. Yeah. Yeah. You got to get <clears throat> one. Yeah, get, yeah. Get, get, get one while you can. I think the prices are going up right now. Well, when he's not coaching, he has more time to paint. So, uh, but I think, you know, the, the swimming community, you know, people like you, Josh, honestly, are, are, are really what I love about our sport. There's a, there's a, there's a humbleness and a, uh, willingness to share. Uh, when I was over at the ISL events, it was it was amazing to watch. In the middle of COVID, in the middle of uh, of a really dangerous situation, you know, 400 swimmers and another 150 or so staff people all come together and build a real unique community. And uh, hopefully, the ISL continues to be something that is a big part of the future of our sport because it was nothing but fantastic are the athletes the professional athletes actually were treated like professional athletes they were they earned money like professional athletes and they got got to feel like they were they were uh, 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 you know they were important and uh, and the, the venue was exciting it was it was it was just first class and uh, and uh, so I, I think our sports at a at a really exciting moment right now where you know we, we've we've grown to a point where where a, uh, you know, I had Andy Murad as one of my swimmers from Israel, who's actually from Santa Monica originally, but I help out with the Israel national team. And she, she at the, at the uh, ISL championships had a run of races and meets that took her to a whole nother level. I don't think she, and she didn't have any idea that she was at that level. And she, when we got back here to San Diego, she, she said, David, I did some research on some of the people I was racing and the, and beating in this meet. It's like, they're way faster than me. I'm like, well, they aren't now. <laughs> <Not anymore. laughs> so let's go. Let's go. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I think that's what's cool about our sport is, is the opportunity to, there's always opportunity to excel. She's 28 years old and she's yeah. just, she did two years of medical school. Then she came out of medical school for two years to train for Israel for the Olympics. And now she's swimming the best she's ever swum in her career by far. Okay. That's what's available in professional swimming in our sport. And I hope the ISL continues because I think that'll, encourage a lot more professionals to keep going yeah i did my lifetime best when i was 28 so exactly, so, good, good exactly. so real quick i'm just going to do a lightning round of your favorite things in closing um uh favorite favorite color favorite color is um blue as in orange and blue <laughs> <That's good. laughs> and uh favorite food item dessert food restaurant anything kind of What's your go-to favorite food thing? Well, it's, it's a, it's, I'm in between two. I, I got to tell you, roasted Brussels sprouts, which is amazing because I hated Brussels sprouts till I was probably 35 years old. And one Thanksgiving, I had to try them because the kids made me try because I make them try everything. And uh, Gail, uh, Kristen's mom, had made some roasted uh, Brussels sprouts. They were amazing. But my real favorite is, uh, is, is a, Vanilla ice cream on a brownie with chocolate syrup. I mean, that's you, know, yeah, you, can't, you can't beat that. You cannot beat that. That's good. That's it. F favorite ISL team. 
Favorite Iowa State. Well, the LA Current clearly is my favorite team, and, and not only because I'm the head coach of it, but also because Lenny Kraselberg's about one of the coolest people in the history of the world. That guy is yeah. amazing, amazing guy. Had Jack Roach as an assistant coach, who's uh, you know has the heart the size of Texas. Kim yeah. Bracken, and then Brett Hawk was with me last year, so I had could have sort of got my community together, and and we've had a great time with. Uh, with the LA current so far. And we, we, uh, we'll, we plan on continuing to, to get better, better. Yeah. I, I knew you'd say that. I just, I just love that. I got to interview Jack a few weeks ago and it was incredible. Yeah. So, he's an amazing man. Guy. Amazing man. Um, favorite city you've ever visited tourist or swimming wise. Yeah. Great question. Great question. I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with Milan. Italy, uh, love Italy. I love the uh, uh, the people. I love the food, love the culture, love the wine. It, it's just uh, there, there's a, there's a lot of things about Italy that, that are that are my favorites. San Diego is not a not a distant second, right. but it's uh, I mean, it, it, it's it's not Milan. <laughs> yeah, well, Italy's my favorite country to visit too because I have a cousin who lives in Florence, and I got hired to teach wow. in Naples, and so I I went for two summers in a row and this was going to be my third summer, but it, everything got kiboshed. But uh, yeah, well, we're I'm, I'm supposed with you. to be going, you know, ISL is supposed to be going to, hopefully we're going to Naples next year after the Olympics. Hopefully that's where the first event will be. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. Cause I know the one event they had there went really well a year ago. Yeah, it did. They uh, sold out crowds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite set? Do you have a favorite kind of uh, uh, memory of a set that, that sticks out in your mind? Yeah, I'd say there, there was a set I used to do at Auburn with because I I would have Ralph Crocker and 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 God rest his soul and yep. and uh, and some other really smart coaches knew how to work the timing system. They would set the timing system up and we'd go we'd go a uh, hundred twenty fives, all at race pace. So, but what we'd start at would be we'd start at a, a high interval right. and it'd come down every ten it would come down one second. The interval will come down. It kept coming down, coming down. Somewhere they would fall out. If you fall out, you sit out too. Then you get back into it. Yeah. But we would do it with the entire team on both sides of the pool. Everybody leaving together all at once, like this on right. a fifty-meter pool. It was awesome. So that was one of my favorites. And there were times also we would do racing. Uh, we'd have bulkhead in the middle of the pool, and they would do races to where it was the first one to get back and first person back was supposed to be smiling in the gutter at the next person. Cause they, cause they beat them. So there'd be competition, <laughs> uh, competition like that. And, and, uh, and I'm, a, I, you know, I love, you know, the coach like me, I love the, I am, you know, if you're, if you're a pure coach, you have to love the, I am. So I'm all about, you know, that now the ISL has hundred, I am hundred, I am the two hundred I am the four and I am when you have to mix all four strokes together. That's the, that's the decathlete of our sport. And, uh, so I, I'm a, I'm a big, I am fan. That's good. You have a favorite dry land or weight room movement. You, my favorite uh dry land movement that, that pertains to swimming is a simple pull-up uh it, it's the to me the biggest indicator that you're making the progress i was just talking about andy beforehand uh rada owen before that as it was one that comes to mind where uh when, when i see especially a females that can do two or three and so many times i've told them look when you can go 10 pull-ups and you can do two or three right now you're going to change your entire trajectory in the sport Yep. And, uh, and so I think being able to handle your body weight, uh, and, and pull-ups is one of the ways to measure that as long as you don't kip up and, and cheat up, then, uh, I think it's one of the, the good ways to measure yourself. So, uh, guys get to 20 pull-ups, ladies on this call, get to 10 pull-ups. That's, that's, uh, your assignment, uh, after this podcast. Yeah. You do that. You know, you're going to go fast. Yeah. That's good. You know, and, well, and, I, and I think the whole gymnastics thing, just be, just being an athlete in our sport, I mean, our sport, you know, sometimes doesn't get a good reputation for the athleticism because we're in the water. The reality is the best athletes do become the best swimmers. You know, Caleb Dressel is a great example of that. He would definitely be playing some other NFL or NBA sport if he wasn't swimming. He's such an athletic freak. Uh, and, and thank God he's got he's, he's take he's picked swimming, uh, and especially for the USA, because uh, uh, he's, he, you know, so keep in mind that that the better athletes make better, make better summers. And during this time of COVID, sometimes we can't get all the pool time we, but we need, but Hey, there's a, there's a patch of grass out near your yard or there's a, there's a playground somewhere down the road. Go be active in that thing and become a better athlete. Yeah. That's good advice. 
Well, I just want to say thank you for always modeling the balance of family, faith, fun, and fast swimming. And uh, it's, it's rare to have a really healthy combination of that. And uh, I know it hasn't been easy, but you've really just persevered and been a, been a model for having that balance of pursuing excellence in many areas of your life. And I just want to thank you for being an inspiration and example. And, and I cherish our friendship. And I know we get to see each other pretty regularly at, at meets and retreats and, and different, different events. And I look forward to doing it again. But any, any other closing thoughts on finding that balance? I, you know, Josh, honestly, you're one of my role models. And, and it's really interesting because as a young coach who who was, you know, really chasing, you know, the, the, the athletic, you know, dream and goal as a team, I would always look at you and, and just be amazed at, uh, at, at your willingness to do the, the goodwill of the goodwill for God and uh, always inspired by that. And uh, it, it, to this day, I, I just continue to be so impressed with the with the man you are, the father you are, the husband you are, and uh, honestly, you've been even though you're younger than me, you've been a role model to me, and uh, and I just appreciate that you're also you know podcasting like this to to share more things about uh, the full story of becoming a total person, and it isn't just about. In fact, it's very it's not at all about just the athletic part. It's the growth as an athlete, and if that growth is uh, is is emotional and spiritual. Uh, it's even better because that that doesn't leave you, you know. I mean, and so that that assurance that we have a loving God is one of the things that's really foundation to my life and uh, to my family, and and we'll continue to cherish that uh, until uh, God takes us home. Amen. Well, that's the sign of an ultimate swimmer that you develop yourself physically, mentally, and spiritually, and that you know how to work hard, have fun, and help others along the way. I think that's why we're here on this earth is to help others. And absolutely, Josh. Yeah been doing a super job and I can't wait to see you around in a pool again. All right, partner. Good luck to your season. Yep. Take care. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. I want to take a moment to tell you about my favorite swim cap, the Hammerhead swim cap. It's the safest, fastest, longest lasting, most comfortable swim cap in the world. It's one of a kind patented honeycomb shock absorbing technology will prevent concussions and the hammerhead cap has no wrinkles to ensure top speed with the least resistance. And it's super comfortable. That's easy to get on and easy to get off, and it will never tear. This is the last cap you will ever need to buy. Safety and speed, all at hammerheadswimcaps.com. Thank you for joining us on this Ultimate Swimmer podcast. We hope you enjoyed hearing from these Olympians and life champions and how certain habits and decisions help them on their journey and they can help you too. If there is an ultimate swimmer from your team that you would like to nominate that we can recognize on our show, just email me at josh at joshdavis.com. That's josh at joshdavis.com. And tell us about how your ultimate swimmer is making a difference in your swimming community. And that's the goal, to make a difference and swim with purpose. Not only are you getting better, but you're helping those around you get better too. When you realize you were born for the water, born for greatness, and born to serve others, you are on your way to becoming an ultimate swimmer. I'm Josh Davis. Until next time, keep streamlining and keep smiling. See you around the pool soon.